uh, uh, textbook answer, I imagine, from the middle part of the century would have been because we see classical field theories in nature and we should quantize them. But Weinberg was dissatisfied with this. And he um, uh, uh, promulgated a point of view, um, especially in his uh, field theory books, um, which is that quantum fields offer the most useful formalism to, to describe fundamentally particles that have local interactions, satisfying, as we've discussed already, cluster decomposition and so on. Um, and this, this has a much uh, stronger feeling of inevitability about it. Whatever the underlying um, uh, uh, theory of the world is, so long as it has relativity and quantum mechanics at low enough energies, long enough distances, it's guaranteed to be described by a quantum field theory. But uh, it's a notion of particle that is primary here. We're trying to describe the consistently the interactions of particles and uh, local fields are a convenient tool for doing that. So as Weinberg does, and really going back to Wigner, the, uh, we begin with the very simple question, what is a particle? Um, and most abstractly, a particle is a unitary uh, irrep of the Poincaré group. Um, uh, the, the intuitive idea of a particle, like an electron here being the same as the electron there and in other places, um, uh, and rotated, the spins rotated in different ways and moving at, di at different velocities. The fact that we give them all the same name electron <laughs> is a reflection of the space-time symmetries. So we have the space-time symmetries that have to be implemented in a unitary way on the Hilbert space because of quantum mechanics. Um, and so you can imagine that, 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 that a particle just by diagonalizing translations um, uh, uh, is characterized by giving some energy and, uh, and uh, momentum satisfying the on-shell uh, mass condition. Um, and it can have some other labels too, sigma, and uh, we can uh, start from some reference momentum and define all other reference momenta by some canonical boost that takes us from uh, K to P. Uh, and we can use the unitary um, uh, 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 representation of that special boost uh, to define what I mean by the other labels that the particle might have other than, uh, other than uh, its uh, momenta. But once you do that, you're stuck. And if you take a general unitary transformation corresponding to a general Lorentz transformation on a general state, you will mix these indices up with each other in general, and they will transform under not the Lorentz group, but the action of the Lorentz group and is intuitively clear where uh, corresponds to those Lorentz transformations that leave the momentum of the particle invariant. Okay, so, so, so and, and those are what correspond to the additional degrees of freedom the spin degrees of freedom, which transform not under Lorentz transformations, but under the little group, uh, Wigner's little group of the Lorentz transformations. So um, uh, now, uh, so that's what particles are. Now we we imagine that we have some uh, some some particles interaction, some some in some in states with particles, out states of particles, and here is the logic that. Uh, uh, that lets us, uh, that leads us to fields, we begin by just trying to label all of the states um, of, uh, of various particles. We define raising and lowering operators. This just defines them as ways of um, uh, simply characterizing uh, uh, operators in this Hilbert space. Now, crucially, uh, we want to build some interaction Hamiltonian so that the scattering processes involving these elementary particles satisfy the very minimal notion of locality that goes into cluster decomposition, which, uh, which very precisely said that if I look at the connected part of the uh, scattering amplitude for a bunch of particles, there should only be one overall delta function for momentum conservation. I shouldn't have two different pieces of delta function for momentum conservation, which would uh, products of two different pieces that would uh, that would tell us that what's going on here is not uncorrelated with what's going on arbitrarily far away. And in order to do that, you have to build uh, the interaction Hamiltonian as an integral over something local over space of some Hamiltonian density. And in order for these things to, to transform nicely under the symmetries, translations, and so on, we should build uh, uh, functions of position. These fields, phi plus or minus out of a position that I make from, um, from uh, taking linear combinations of the A's and the A daggers. So that's why uh, fields are useful for describing the local interactions of particles. And this, this much has nothing to do with the Lorentz invariance. Finally, with Lorentz invariance, um, uh, in order for time evolution in one frame to actually give us the same answer for the S matrix as doing things in any different frame, uh, we have to have that the time orderings and the definition of the uh, perturbative expansion of the S matrix don't matter, which forces that the Hamiltonian density should commute with itself outside the light cone. 
which in turn tells you that the Hamiltonian density uh, has to be built out of those particular combinations of phi plus and phi minus that we normally identify as relativistic quantum fields, giving us a notion of antiparticles, spin statistics, and so on. All right, so that's the, that's the sort of rough logic. We're trying to describe the uh, local interactions of particles, and we use fields as the convenient way of doing it. Now, the moment we have particles with spin, life gets a little bit more interesting because the amplitude itself only has little group indices. The amplitude does not transform like a Lorentz tensor. If you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, you have to pick up a little group transformation on the, uh, on the uh, little group indices. What we, however, compute with fields are things that are Lorentz tensors. So here's an example of uh, what we do with massive, uh, with the uh, spin one fields, for example. So in order to go from one to the other, we also have to have polarization vectors which are objects that sort of convert between Lorentz and little group indices. And we can think of again intuitively as putting the fields that we see on the right-hand side on shell to get the actual uh, amplitudes of the particles on the left-hand side. And this is all well and good, except uh, for the very well-known, but also very important and dramatic difference between massless and massive particles. The degrees of freedom for massless and massive particles, the structure of the little group for massless and uh, massive particles uh, with spin. Um, uh, the, uh, the massive little group in D space-time dimensions is just D minus one dimensional rotations, but the massless little group is D minus two dimensional rotations. Um, that's the intuitive fact that a spin one particle, for example, a massive W, um, no matter how it's moving, you can go to a frame where it's at rest and you can tilt your head and see it uh, spin in all three different possible ways. And in general, spin S particle is 2S plus one degrees of freedom. But you can't do that with a massless particle. You can't uh, catch up with it. Um, and so all we can talk about, the only spin degrees of freedom that it has is helicity, the spin in the direction of motion. Um, so really, fundamentally, only one degree of freedom is forced on you for a massless particle of spin. If you have a parity, even in some approximation, it's two because you should be able to see it uh, both uh, both uh, holistic. So this dramatic difference between the number of degrees of freedom of massless and massive is an extra challenge for the field description. And we can see that very simply in the structure of the polarization vectors. If we start with spin one, for example, epsilon mu, of course, is four degrees of freedom. If I want to describe the three degrees of freedom of a massive spin one, I can do that by imposing epsilon dot p equals zero. That gives me three degrees of freedom. That's good. Uh, but if I have massless spin one, I just can't do that. There's simply no Lorentz invariant way of getting down to the two degrees of freedom associated with a massless spin one particle. And if you make some arbitrary choice for how to label the two polarizations for the massless spin one particle, if you do a Lorentz transformation that leaves a momentum invariant, you'll see that uh, you won't come back to the same form of the polarization vector and it'll instead shift by something proportional to the momentum itself. Therefore, if we want to use this strategy of lo using local quantum fields to describe the interactions of these particles, we have to introduce a new idea. We have to declare a redundancy that helicity states are labeled by equivalent classes of polarization vectors that are shifted proportional to the momentum. This is what the shift looks like for spin one. This is what it looked like for spin two. Of course, we can uh, recognize these as linearized gauge transformations or linearized diffeomorphisms. But from this point of view, they're just sort of forced on us uh, simply by uh, trying to describe the correct number of uh, degrees of freedom. Now, this redundancy means that there's a huge constraint on whatever uh, the, the Feynman amplitudes are uh, for massless particles with spin. If we're supposed to get the same answer, no matter which representative in this equivalence class uh, we choose, then the amplitudes would better be invariant if I shift the polarization vector proportional to their momentum. And so for massless spin one, we have to have this constraint that P mu dotted into M mu with any other indices is equal to zero. For spin two, similarly, again, P mu dotted into M mu nu with any other indices should equal zero. Um, and uh, from, a, from the conventional approach, these are the on shell word identities. But, uh, and in the conventional textbook way of thinking about these, these come out pretty late in the development. From this point of view, um, they're primary uh, because they're what's necessary in order to make sure that despite appearances, uh, um, the amplitudes are actually physically Lorentz invariant. The mu nus are, are good Lorentz tensors, um, but the polarization vectors are not. Only these equivalence uh, classes are Lorentz invariant objects. And so this is what's necessary in order uh, to, to consistently describe the, uh, the reduced number of degrees of freedom for massless particles with spin. Uh, 
In Weinberg's hands, uh, this turned into astonishingly restrictive and powerful statements um, of the Weinberg soft theorems. And the Weinberg soft theorems tell us about all consistent possible long range forces. So Weinberg started with the idea to imagine you have n particles scattering, but with an n plus, uh, with, with one additional uh, particle, um, which has a, a massless particle with some spin s and some momentum q. And the question is, what could the leading amplitude look like as q goes to zero? Now, um, it's, it's possible for the amplitude to have a singularity as q goes to zero. Uh, and the only places it could have a singularity are where the uh, or, or, or where the massless particle is attached to an, an, an external lock. Uh, that's because the sort of propagator here has a one over p plus q squared minus m squared, um, which, uh, which is just a one over uh, p dot q. So we can have singularities coming from when the particles are attached to the external leg. And so what can the leading possible behavior look like? Well, so uh, here I've written down what it could look like for particles of spin one, two, um, uh, potentially particles of massless spin one, two, three, and higher. Uh, 